Well, it's good to see you here tonight. You know, when we take trips like this, people always come to me and say, when are you going to show us slides about your trip? And so I thought we would go ahead and get that over with here tonight so folks wouldn't ask me about this trip. But uh, we had a wonderful time. I know you all prayed for us, and I'm very grateful for your prayers. And so we want to uh, talk about this. Um, Okay, it is back there. All right, Egypt in the Bible. Uh, Well, we took a group from our church. Now, normally we, uh, from the seminary, we'll be taking trips like this. Part of our students' education is to go abroad at places like this to learn uh, God's Word better. And so we we invite also folks from our church that would want to be a part of this along with some of the students at Faith. And so we had a wonderful group of people that came with us. Now, immediately when we got over there, our first goal was to to basically um, fit in with the Egyptian people to mingle with the culture and to be Egyptian. And so so we we made an effort to do that. And, and, um, you know, for some it was easier than it was for others, but... Um, anyway, we, uh, we had a good time getting to know some of the people that were there. Also, we wanted to uh, make sure that we um, w- got to know the wildlife, the animals that were there as well, uh, the camels. That didn't always go as well as we had wanted it to go <laughs> also. What are some of the things that we did while we were there? Well, we did some camel riding uh, while we were there. Here's our group on camels. Uh, we, we wanted to take the, the transportation that's used in Egypt. And so there is some of our folks. You can see those pyramids there in the back. Also, horse and buggy. Um, You know, we, on one place, um, I think that was um, from the boat, we went to a place called Edfu uh, to a temple there, uh, the Temple of Horus. And the way we got there was was horse and carriage. When I was in Egypt a few years back, we stayed at Luxor for a few days. That was really the way you get around in Luxor. The, The farther south you go in some of those towns, uh, you know, rather than calling a taxi, you just call a horse and driver, a buggy driver. And, um, and I remember I had a buggy driver there at Luxor that I took one ride with him, and he, he, gave me, he gave me his WhatsApp number. He said, look, text me if you need a ride anywhere, and I'll take you anywhere in Luxor. And he said, you want to know the name of my horse? I said, sure. What's your horse's name? It's Madonna. <laughs> but anyway, so Madonna took me all over Luxor. But so, yeah, we did, some, we did some of the carriage riding in, in some of the small towns. We also buy boat. This is our guide, Fayed, uh, who did a tremendous job. Fayed um, is a converted Muslim. He's a believer in Jesus Christ. Um, I, I thought it was wonderful that we got a guide who was a Christian. Um, and he basically believed the Bible. Um, and, you know, it was very encouraging the first day to hear him say some of the things that he said about, you know, his belief in the Bible and uh, I had a chance to talk to him and get him to know. Of course, all of our group got to know Fayed and really got to like him. And uh, it's hard being a Christian there in Egypt where it's 95 or more percent Muslim. And to, you know, make a profession to be a Christian, to be saved, and then, you know, turn, turn away from Islam, it's not easy on people like him. But uh, he, is a, he is a believer. And so we, <clears throat> we, we traveled by boat a few places. <clears throat> we went on a boat down the Nile, but we went on a small boat to an island. Uh, the Temple of Philae, uh, Philae, and um, we'll give you some pictures about that. But also, we took planes everywhere. We uh, flew to Luxor, then from, and then um, we flew to, from Ajwan back to Cairo, so Cairo to Luxor, then Ajwan back to Cairo, and so on. Now, when we got there, one of the first things that we visited was the Cairo Museum. It's a beautiful museum there, and they have a lot of finds from all over Egypt, you know, I could spend the whole rest of the hour just on that, and I, I'm not going to do that. But there are two, two specific things I'd like to point out that were interesting there. First of all, they had all of the finds from King Tut's tomb. That was a big discovery. People like to hear about that. Howard Carter was the archaeologist that found King Tut's tomb in 1922. Uh, everyone thought that the Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Kings is um, right across from Luxor. Um, you know, you have this huge valley where pharaohs would dig their tombs and they would uh, be buried there. You know, the pyramids are basically what they used earlier. Um, pyramids were the tombs of pharaohs, but really they were advertisement for tomb robbers. You know, hard to miss a pyramid in Egypt. And so a lot of those tombs would get robbed. And so they stopped building pyramids and they started to use the Valley of the Kings uh, and their tombs would be hidden there. And uh, there's about 67 tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And they thought that by the time Howard Carter began digging in 1900 there, that all the tombs had basically been dug out. There were no more tombs left there. But he had a hunch that there was still one 
tomb that was still there in the Valley of the Kings, and of, and of course he was right. This is the death mask of King Tut, or Tutan uh, Common, and, uh, and, and that's there in the Cairo Museum. But the thing that really, to me, was more interesting than the death mask was his chair. And this is a picture that was taken of that. And because of the way the sun is kind of situated on that, it's hard to see really well. But there's a footstool there at the bottom of his chair. Can you see that in the picture? Uh, here's a better picture of it. But when you look at this, on the footstool there are written in six enemies of the Egyptian nation. And they're written, they're written in and inscribed in the footstool there. And yet that is where he would put his feet. He would rest his feet. There's a message there. Remember Psalm 110? I think, Caleb, you just sang this, didn't you? Uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. No doubt that's what that's referring to, the custom where the kings would put the, their enemies on, the foot, on their footstools as a sign of victory. I thought that's very interesting. Um, how that refers to that in Scripture. But then also there was uh, another um, thing there in the British Museum, very interesting, tucked away in the corner of the museum. And it's funny where it's located. It's almost like it's out of the way, almost like, you know, they put it back in the corner somewhere, like it's not a big deal. But to me, this is one of the biggest deals in the whole museum. This is called the Merneptah Stila, or the is Israel Stila. And it was discovered in 1896 by a famous British archaeologist named Sir Flinders Petrie. He discovered it at the ancient city of Thebes, which is Luxor. And uh, it's just, you can just see in the picture here, there's this giant slab that stands over seven feet tall. And basically, this is largely an account of Pharaoh Meneptah's military victories in 1207 BC. Now, the find is significant because um, the last three lines of uh, of, there are 28 lines in it. The last three of 28 lines deals with a campaign that he had in the land of Canaan, and a reference is made to the, um, Israel, to the nation of Israel, how that he had, uh, his seed is scattered. In other words, the idea that he had defeated the Israelites, and he's kind of boasting about that. These pharaohs like to boast about their military victories. But the reason why this is important is because it establishes that the nation of Israel was was a nation, was an established people in the land of Canaan at that time. And again, why is that important? Because there's a big debate over the dating of the Exodus. Was, did the Exodus take place in 1446 B.C., the early date, or was it the late date in 12-something um, B.C.? Well, this find here supports the idea that the Exodus happened early in 1446 B.C., and that's important because that harmonizes with the Bible. And we're going to look at that a little bit closer, but that's why this find was so important because it shows that the Bible is uh, historically accurate with reference to the Exodus. And again, we're going to look at that a little bit closer. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the Egypt in the Bible. When we study Egypt, uh, the reason we study it is because this is one of the lands that's of the Bible. Um, Egypt, you know, is mentioned a lot in Scripture uh, it's mentioned 600 times in the Bible, more than any other nation except for the nation of Israel. So Israel's mentioned the most. Second most is the nation of Egypt. Now, I want you to look on this map here. Look at the top where it says Lower Egypt, and then on the bottom where it says Upper Egypt. We would say that opposite, wouldn't we? We would say the top is Upper Egypt and the bottom is Lower, but that's not what they do in Egypt. They say the top is Lower Egypt, the bottom is Upper. And part of the reason for that is because the Nile flows from south to north rather than from north to south. Okay, so you have to remember that. It flows upward. Um, and so, um, so this is kind of a, a good little sketch here of the Nile River and some of the, the key um, temples along the way, um, along the Nile in, in upper Egypt. We started in lower Egypt in Cairo, and we visited the uh, pyramids of Giza and Saqqara, those pyramids there, and then we made our way down to Upper Egypt, and we visited the Valley of the Kings. We were visited, uh, if you can see on the map there, Karnak, which is right there at Luxor, across the um, Nile at Luxor, and then also um, on down to the uh, Philae Temple, and then Abu Simbel was another place that we went, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of those as we go along. 
But other than the 66 books of the Bible, Egypt is mentioned, of the 66 books of the Bible, Egypt is mentioned in 29 of them. And there's so much biblical history that comes from Egypt, and it plays an important role in God's plan of redemption. Um, you know, some of the, some of the um, most well-known patriarchs in the Old Testament uh, lived in and around Egypt. Abraham, for example, our guide, Fayed, uh, basically, uh, you know, he told us a lot of things, but one of the things that kind of stood out to me was that the word amen was a word that Abraham introduced to Egypt. He said one of the reasons why he said God sent Abraham to Egypt was to, you know, introduce this word, amen. And you see it in a lot of Egyptian names, uh, amen hotep, you know, uh, tutin, uh, it's actually tut, uh, uh, Khan and then Amen, I believe. But you see it in so many names, and that's what he said. You know, Abraham, wherever he went, built the altars and would say, Amen, Amen to God, and kind of introduce that word. But anyway, Joseph, we know of his story in Egypt, Jacob and Moses as well. Moses, you know, the people in Egypt say Moses was Egyptian. You know, he lived in Egypt. Um, his culture was Egyptian. Uh, he spoke Egyptian, and so on. So when you have to uh, when, you, when you learn about Moses, you have to know the history of Egypt in order to really understand uh, God's work in Moses' life. And so uh, Moses was born in Egypt. He was raised as a, lo- a royal prince in the palace of Pharaoh, and he, he fled the country. Later, it came back to lead his people out. And, of course, we know that story. Um, when Abraham went to Egypt, the pyramids of Giza were already 600 years old. Think about that how old the pyramids were. They were already 600 years old. And when Abraham came to Egypt, they probably looked a little bit more like this. They they would have been covered in gleaming limestone and would have had a huge gold cap on the top of the pyramids that were there. And so, you know, they pretty much look exactly like this today. The gold and the limestone are gone. The pyramids are still there, and they still continue to amaze and astound people. So they were built about 5,000 years ago, and they're still some of the largest man-made structures in the world today. In fact, the Giza pyramids are considered one of the seven wonders of the world. And if you go there and look at it, you can understand why. I mean, those, those stones that were, that were used to make them, they're huge stones, some of them the size of Volkswagens. I mean, they're just, it's just a huge, huge thing there. When we talk about Egypt, we also have to understand um, some of the history of it and um, we need to talk about the Rosetta Stone and the important role that that played in helping us understand the culture and what's written on the monuments there in Egypt. So in 1799, <clears throat> Napoleon invaded Egypt with his army. Now, he hoped to make Egypt a French possession so that he could move on and attack the British in India. But the British Admiral Nelson um, had destroyed his, na- his naval fleet, and Napoleon, defeated by that, boarded a boat, and he left his army behind. And so his military venture there in Egypt turned out to be an absolute disaster. It was a failure in every way except for one. And, and what is that? There was the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. It was discovered in 1799. While the French army was in Egypt, one of the soldiers made an incredible discovery. And this discovery really is the reason why we know what is written on the monuments and on the temples there in Egypt. He, this ancient stone that he found basically unlocked mysteries of this uh, long-lost uh, civilization that had been lost to mankind for so many years. Um, also, let me talk a little bit about the Nile. It's interesting when you go to Egypt, you'll be, if, you're, if you're by the Nile, you'll see it's so green and lush, and you look out over the horizon, everything is brown and it's sand, and, and there's nothing else there. But along the Nile, there's a strip of just fertile, lush land, and, and that's what is important to the Egyptian people. They're able to grow um, crops and all kinds of things there. And the Nile is the, the, world's most, is the world's longest river. It covers one-tenth of the world's circumference. Think about that. It passes through nine countries. Um, I was in Africa one time at Uganda, and we went out on the Nile. Uh, the Nile goes all the way down into Africa and in some of the countries down there. So the Nile is central for the life of people in Egypt, just as it's been for thousands of years. And t- while we were there, we were able to go down the Nile. Uh, the, the picture on the left of this man um, is uh, when I was there before, 
you know, you can just go down to the Nile if you want to go somewhere. These, these boatmen will take you down the Nile. There's no engine on the boat. They, do, they use nothing but a sail. And uh, they know how to navigate and bring you back and forth, you know, in just a boat with a sail. Now, while we were there, we took a, a, a big, um, nice boat down the Nile. And that's a picture of uh, one of many that I took along the, the Nile River there as we were going down. And in the evening, it was beautiful there, um, you know, just, just gorgeous. <clears throat> and we passed by temples along the way, and uh, we'll talk about that. But without the Nile, there would be no Egypt as we know it. Uh, uh, the land of Egypt is 96% desert. Less than 4% of its total land area is productive. All the rest is just dry, barren desert. And so, again, to the Egyptians, the Nile River is indeed the source of, lo- of life. And, and, and you, again, you go past some wonderful monuments there um, as you go down the Nile, and we'll talk about that. But let me, let me go back and talk a little bit about the Rosetta Stone. You can see here on the map where Rosetta is located in uh, lower Egypt, right up there uh, on the coast. And um, it was at Rosetta, that the mouth of the Nile, that one of the greatest archaeological discoveries was made in fact, it could be argued that it's the greatest archaeological discovery in all history. And here's how it happened. Um, again, Napoleon invaded Egypt. He, uh, um, he had been there for a year. It's now 1798. They were there to map the land, study the, the, the monuments, and so on. He brought scientists, and he brought artists with him. And um, after he had been there a year, um, they began to dig a trench at a place called uh, Fort Rosetta. Now, let me back up and just say that Napoleon and his men looked around at some of the temples and the monuments, and they saw this strange hieroglyphic writing on the walls and the mon- on these monuments. And, and the experts that Napoleon brought with them, none of them could read uh, what was on those, these walls. I mean, this was all a mystery. Just fascinating picture writing. They didn't know if the pictures stood for something or if it sounded out a, a letter or a word. They were just mystified over what hieroglyphs were actually saying. Uh, none of his men could read it. None of the experts he brought could read it. In fact, no one in the world at that time could read Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, and so for 15 centuries, the knowledge of this writing was lost to the world and the civilization. Um, and you can, again, see some of the uh, hieroglyphs here. This was all a mystery to people. So um, a French officer made a discovery. One of Napoleon's officers was supervising the restoration of Fort Rosetta on the banks of the Nile. And as he was digging a trench, he came upon an unusual stone about, you know, uh, you know about three feet high. And uh, it, it was pretty weighty stone there that he found. And he immediately realized he had discovered something very special that was important to, um, you know, basically to the scientists that were there in his army. And they discovered this black basalt stone. Now that we call this the Rosetta Stone. And uh, this was the key that unlocked the puzzle of understanding hieroglyphics or Egyptian writing. Um, and so the re- and we'll talk about this, but um, you know the reason why this was so important um, was because again, it, it basically whereas before you couldn't read the monuments, you couldn't read what was on the walls. Now unlocking the mystery of hieroglyphs, you were able to tap into the knowledge of the Egyptians. Um, this, by the way, the Rosetta Stone is in the British Museum in London. Uh, after Napoleon was defeated by the British, the British took control of everything, including this find. And that's a picture I took when I was at the British Museum. That's the actual Rosetta Stone that was found there in, in Fort Rosetta. And it was basically, this stone was part of, the, of a decree that was issued by King Ptolemy the fifth. He was king of all Egypt in 196 B.C. This was when Egypt was really not, no longer a world power. They were actually on the, on the way down. And uh, really what the text says is not important. He was a- actually de- de- establishing a decree um, about in, in some of the cult temples there. Um, what is said, again, is not very important. Um, the important thing is, is that the way it was said here, On the stone, they found the top 14 lines were Egyptian hieroglyphs. The next 32 lines was a a language called Demotic. The bottom 54 lines of this stone was Greek. And the important thing is is that every, all these languages said the same thing. They said it in three different languages. 
So they could read Greek, and all they had to do then was match the Greek word with the Egyptian hieroglyph. And that's the way they, would, they learned to understand Egyptian hierog- hieroglyphics. Now, this sounds easy, um, but it's a lot harder than it sounds. Um, in fact, you know, it took years and years, and experts were, linguistic experts were laboring over this to try to understand um, <clears throat> this, even though they had the Greek text and they had the hieroglyphs and trying to compare it, they were still trying to figure it out. And so the Rosetta Stone basically sat, sat in the British Museum for decades. No one could decipher it. No one could crack the code. Along came a man by the name of Jean-Francois Champollion. He was a brilliant young linguist. Uh, he was just nine years old when the Rosetta Stone was discovered. But by that time, he was already an accomplished linguist. He was fluent in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew when he was nine years old. Yeah, so that's pretty, pretty good. Um, by his mid-teens, he had mastered six more oriental languages, and he turned his attention to the Rosetta Stone and devoted all of his energy to cracking the hieroglyphic code, and it kind of became his passion. And uh, from, from, the, from the Greek that he knew, he, he, he studied that and also the, the Demotic, but he also learned the Coptic language of right there in, where he lived in, in uh, Paris, there was a Coptic congregation of Christians that um, he would go and listen to them speak and learn their language because he felt that was kind of a key in understand, understanding Egypt, Egyptian hieroglyphs. So after years and years of detailed study, he finally was able to understand uh, hieroglyphic writing. And um, he, he, until then, you know, they thought that hieroglyphs were basically some sort of, you know, symbolic meanings um, used as letters uh, to write only foreign names. But now he recognized that the signs were used for sounds as well as words. And uh, so uh, the key was in the, you see that cartouche there in the picture, that oblong circle um, that was normally used to give a king's name or the name of a god. Um, When he was able to successfully recognize the names of kings, um, that helped him unlock the, the, uh, the mystery there. Now, why are they called a cartouche, those little oblong um, things that you see there? Um, well, because when Napoleon and his men came to Egypt and they saw those on the monuments, to them it looked like a French bullet, which was called a cartouche. So they just called them a cartouche, which is a French word for cartridge or bullet. But anyway, the, the discovery was made. He announced it in Paris on the 17th of September, 1822. He cracked the code. And... Um, Again, until the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, um, no one was able to read hieroglyphs. But after that, um, you know, they were able to read these monuments and able to read the history of uh, Egypt. And what, you know, what that did for us is that it opened up a door. And what they found was that a lot of what was written on these temple walls and monuments harmonized with the Bible. Whereas before you had people criticizing the Bible, saying, oh, the Bible's not historically reliable. Now, when they're reading these monuments, they're thinking, you know what? This harmonizes with Scripture. This harmonizes with with what the Bible says. Um, They found it just as what Scripture says. Let me give you a few examples of that. Um, uh, The Sphinx and the Passover. Uh, We went to the Sphinx to look at it. Um, when every time I look at it, what I think about is the Passover in, in the book of Exodus. You say, why? Well, let me tell you why. Um, the Sphinx is considered, again, to be one of the greatest statues on earth, uh, one of the wonders of the world because it's right there by the Giza pyramids. It's carved out of one big piece of limestone there. But between the poles of the Sphinx, there's an impressive stone monument. You can see in the picture there that, that again, that tablet stone that is called the Dream Stealer, and it was written there by a man by the name of Tud Moses IV. That's kind of a close-up look at the Dream Stealer there. And the hieroglyph basically tells a story. It describes how Tud Moses IV became Pharaoh of all of Egypt. And uh, it, it, the story in the hieroglyph goes like this. One day, Tud Moses was out hunting, and he got tired, and he decided to sit down by the Sphinx in the shade of it. And when he did, he fell asleep. And 
while he went to sleep, he had a dream, and the sphinx appeared to him in a dream, and the sphinx said to him, um, you know, if you uncover the sand from around me, I will make you the next pharaoh of Egypt. And so that's what this whole dream stealer talks about, his hunting expedition, falling asleep, the promise that the sphinx made. And basically what it is, it's, it's, it's an exalted justification of why he became the next pharaoh of Egypt. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, why is this necessary? By the way, here's a picture of Tud Moses IV. Uh, that's his mummy in the Cairo Museum there. Um, he's not taking a nap there, but anyway, um, he had better days. But uh, why would he need to erect this tablet, this stone, and describe why he was the next pharaoh? It's, again, it's an exalted justification of why he was put on the throne as the next, the next pharaoh. And why was this necessary? Because Tud Moses IV was not the firstborn son of, of the pharaoh. His father was Omenotep II, and so he was the secondborn. So you have to ask the question, why was he the secondborn son put on the throne of Egypt? What happened to the firstborn son? Well, there's nothing in Egyptian history that answers that question, but the Bible does solve that mystery. Who was the pharaoh of the Exodus? The pharaoh of the Exodus, Tutmosis III was the pharaoh of the oppression, but Amenhotep II, um, some people pronounce it Amenhotep. I call it Amenhotep. It's just quicker. But um, he, was the, he was the father of Tudmosis IV, and he was also the pharaoh of the Exodus. And we know what happened because the Bible tells us, right? In Exodus 12, 29 to 30, there's the death of the firstborn. What did God say? At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn of Egypt from the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon. All those people in Egypt during that last plague that God brought to Egypt, if you did not have the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, what happened to the firstborn child? They all died, right? The firstborn son of Amenhotep II died during the plague. And now here's Tud Moses IV giving this exalted justification of why he was the next pharaoh. That sounds, you know, again, on these monuments, these pharaohs love to brag. They always like to put themselves in the best possible, um, you know, light. And I think this, this story of, you know, the, the Sphinx appearing to him, promising him the throne, that sounds a whole lot better than, you know, dad got into a fight with Yahweh and he lost, you know. And so this is really what happened here in this story. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was a loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. So Tud Moses IV came to the throne of Egypt unexpectedly because his brother, who was the crown prince, was slain during the tenth plague of Egypt. Now, there's nothing in the land of Egypt or on any of the uh, walls of Egypt that tell you that story. You have to go to the Bible to, to see how that, um, how that plays out but it makes perfect sense. But this leads to a question, who was the pharaoh of the Exodus? Okay? Who was the pharaoh of the Exodus? Well, Joel Brenner, of course, was the pharaoh of the Exodus. How many of you watched the movie The Ten Commandments? All right? We've all watched that movie. And in The Ten Commandments, he plays the part of Ramses the Great. Ramses the Great, you know, they say that Ramses was the pharaoh of the Exodus. How many of you ever watched the cartoon, The Prince of Egypt? It also says the same thing. Ramses was the pharaoh of the Exodus. The only problem with that is it's not true, okay? Um, there's only two possibilities of who could have been the pharaoh of the Exodus, all right? Because the, and during the 18th dynasty, uh, it could have only been Amenhotep II because of the dating there. And he actually, with him and his father, Tud Moses III, they were the ones that, you know, with the length of their reign that fit, you know, uh, them being able to be Pharaoh of the Oppression, Pharaoh of the Exodus. The other possibility would be the 19th dynasty. That's the late date. And with Seti I would be the Pharaoh of the Oppression. Ramses II would be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So it's either the early date or the late date. You have to choose which one. Now, most people choose the late date. That's the popular date. Ramses was the pharaoh of the Exodus. 
So again, it's, it's one of the two. We know, however, it could not have been Ramses. You say, why? Because the Bible gives us the date of the Exodus. Where? In 1 Kings 6, 1, it gives us the date. How does it give us the date? Now, it came to pass, and it came after the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of, the, of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. So the Bible tells us that in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, Solomon began his reign in 970 B.C., fourth year of his reign, he began to build the temple. It was 480 years after the Exodus. So if you do the math, you come up with the date, 1446 B.C. That's what the Bible says. So you either choose to believe that or you don't. So the pharaoh of the Exodus had to be um, Amenhotep or Amenhotep the second. And so that's why we know that the dream stela between the Pauls of the Sphinx, where Tud Moses is giving this justification of being the next pharaoh, we know that his brother was the son of the pharaoh of the Exodus, okay, because of the date that the Bible gives us. Everybody with me? Okay. So again, this shows you how the Bible is reliable historically. And, and this is important because the Bible has come under attack and saying, you know, it's a good religious book, it's just you can't trust the history, is what people say. But our whole gospel is based on historical events. And if the Bible is not historically reliable, then how do we know some of the other things that it mentions is, you know, is true? And so this is an attack on the, on the Bible when I say it's not historically reliable. But when you look at the things that are discovered in archaeology, and you look at some of the things that are written on the monuments and temple walls and uh, in Egypt, you find that the Bible is indeed historically reliable. Now, we didn't get a chance to go here while we were in Egypt, but I wanted to mention that about 125 miles south of the Giza Plain near Cairo, there's a, there's a tomb called the Beni Hassan Hass, 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 Hass tomb there. Um, these are tombs that are cut into the rock, the limestone cliffs there. There was a noble who lived there um, named Betty Hassan, and basically um, they have tomb writings on the tombs there. And what's important is uh, one particular painting that shows a group of Semites coming from Canaan, arriving in Egypt, and it shows the clothes that they wore, the kind of footwear they had, the musical instruments that they played. These tombs date back to the time of Abraham. And this, again, harmonizes with what the Bible says about the patriarchs and people that lived in the land of Canaan. And that's why this, again, it's, it's so important. It, it was common for the people of Canaan to barter for corn in times of famine, and they would go down to Egypt to do that. The Bible tells us this in Genesis 42. When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. And so this painting is one of many that clearly shows that life in ancient Egypt was very much as indicated in the Bible. Now, again, as archaeologists study the hieroglyphs and uncover the past of Egypt, they are discovering um, monuments, inscriptions, people and places that demonstrate the accuracy and the reliability of the Bible. Now, here's a temple that we did visit. This is, uh, uh, again, at Luxor. This is the temple at Karnak. This is a huge temple. It's really magnificent. Um, there's a double row of ram-headed sphinxes there that lead to the great temple of Karnak. This is one of the largest temple complexes that has ever been built. Uh, to enter into this, you have to pass through a gateway that's 140 feet, 140 feet high. And then beyond the first court, you enter into what is called the hypostyle hall. Um, this is, a, again, one of the spectacular sites in, all, in Egypt. Uh, these are sandstone pillars that are, are just gigantic columns as you go into this place. The pillars are about 33 feet in circumference, um, weighing about 70 tons each. Um, and this kind of reminds you of, and it might be similar to Solomon's house of the forest of Lebanon that's mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 7. Um, but these are just huge. If you can see, that's a picture of me in between these pillars. That kind of gives you an idea of how, how big these things are. 
how huge these pillars are. Um, now, the Karnak Temple was built in 2000 BC by a pharaoh, and for 1,300 years, pharaohs would, um, succeeding pharaohs would add pillars, they would add um, obelisks, they would add monuments and memorial walls, boasting about their military triumphs. Uh, there's, a, there's one wall um, at the Temple of Amun that, that basically memorializes a pharaoh by the name of Shishak. That's the wall that's right behind me here in the picture. Now, let me tell you why this is important, because, again, the Bible was criticized because uh, liberals would say, well, the Bible mentions a pharaoh by the name of Shishak. There's nothing in antiquity that mentions this pharaoh. Who is this Shishak? But then along came the Rosetta Stone, and they were able to read, and guess what they found out? There was a pharaoh by the name of Shishak. And, um, and, and basically, he lists all of his military victories, and he had a campaign where he had a military uh, victories over cities in Palestine, and he lists the names of these familiar cities that are mentioned in the Bible on the walls as being cities that he conquered, cities like Gibeon and Megiddo and Beth Shean, all those are listed in these little figurines that you see here in this picture. Um, each conquered city is represented by this figure of a Hebrew man, and the, and the name of the city is on the body, and it's inscribed there on that wall. And again, he's boasting of all of his victories that he had in his campaign in the land of Palestine. Now, again, skeptics said there was no Shishak, but they found his name right here on this wall. And um, but another thing that's interesting about this, they noticed that when he listed the cities in Judah, uh, one of the cities that he did not list was the city of Jerusalem. And this baffles scholars. Why did he not list Jerusalem as one of his conquered cities? And for a long time, this was a mystery. And however... The Bible tells us the reason why Jerusalem is not on this list of conquered cities. And why is that? In 1 Kings 14, in the fifth year of Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. And he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. You see, Shishak's military campaign took place five years into the reign of of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Rehoboam was an ungodly king who provoked the wrath of God. He led the people into idolatry and so on. And basically, Shishak was intending on conquering Jerusalem. Uh, never mind that, you know, Solomon had married, you know, um, Egyptian wives and all that. None of that worked anymore. None of that diplomacy worked. He was intent on conquering Jerusalem. And what happened? What happened? Why didn't he conquer Jerusalem? Well, Scripture records that what Rehoboam did was he basically bribed Shishak. He said, look, if you leave us alone, I'll give you all the gold shields that my father Solomon made and put up on the temple walls. I'll give you gold from our treasury. And, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, Shishak took all the gold shields. Rehoboam basically made new shields of bronze and put them up on the wall instead of the gold. And so being a, a spineless pragmatist, uh, he did this to protect himself. And this was, he gave him basically 500 shields, gold shields. Um, someone estimated their worth today would be about $35 million. So here's Shishak, and he just carries away all this gold out of Jerusalem. That's why Jerusalem is not mentioned as one of the conquered cities, because he never conquered it. Because Rehoboam bribed him, and so therefore he left it alone. By the way, later on when they found Shishak's sarcophagus, it was overlaid in, completely in gold. I wonder where he got all that gold from. I call this the great omission of Jerusalem, why Shishak doesn't put Jerusalem on the hit list. It harmonizes perfectly with what the Bible says there. Now, there's another example of this, and I need to move fast here, but that's the mystery of the Hittites. Again, the Bible mentions the Hittites 
several times. In fact, 48 times the Bible mentions the Hittites. Um, they, it presents them as a, a formidable people, a, a, a mighty empire, one of the most powerful empires of the ancient world. But again, the Bible was criticized by, by liberals who said, we, we don't know anything else in antiquity where the Hittites are ever mentioned. Only the Bible. The Bible talks about the Hittites, but we don't hear about them anywhere else in any other ancient document. So again, they criticized the Bible as being wrong. But again, the Rosetta Stone was found. They read some of the walls of Karnak, and guess what they found out? That here on this wall that you see in the picture, one of the massive walls there, to everyone's amazement. There's a pharaoh right here. His name is Ramses II. And on this wall, he describes how he went to war with the king of the Hittites. And he won one of the great decisive battles in the history of Egypt against the Hittites, the battle of Kadesh. So again, the liberals are wrong and the Bible is right. There are some Hittites. And right here on this wall, he's bragging about this battle that he had with the Hittites right there at the, uh, the Battle of Kadesh. And, um, and so basically the Hittite Empire was a huge empire, um, and it, it, it basically stretched from the Black Sea to Damascus. Again, the hieroglyphs at, the, at Karnak vindicates the Bible. And then I mentioned the Merneptah Stela. Uh, this was found, we, we also saw these two huge monuments right here. Um, this is, again, on the other side, the west bank of the Nile. Uh, they were the entrance of a huge temple. Right behind these monuments that you see there was a huge temple back in antiquity. These two statues are all that remain to this temple. Um, but this is the location where the Manepta Stela was found. I won't take too much time here because I've already talked about this, but um, the archaeologist Petrie discovers this in 1896. And again, it mentions in this stela the nation of Israel, which supports the 1446 um, early date of the Exodus, just like the Bible says. Another, another uh, temple was the temple of Hatshepsut. Who is Hatshepsut? She was the first woman pharaoh. Um, and uh, where did she come from and who was she? This is a temple that we visited that was dedicated to her. One thing that you notice when you go into this temple is that literally a lot of the images of uh, that, that are of her are smashed or the engravings or inscriptions have been vandalized or defaced. And why is that? Well, we, we now know today that Tud Moses III basically had this, her temple vandalized. He was trying to erase her name from history. Why would Tud Moses III want to do that? Um, why would he have these statues of her vandalized? Well, he hated, Tud Moses III hated Hatshepsut, um, but again, the question is, why did he hate her? And the Bible, again, answers this mystery. Did you know that Hatshepsut is mentioned in the Bible? She's a woman who pulled Moses out of the Nile. Exodus 2.5. We know that story. She went down to the river, and she saw an ark, and she made her maidens fetch it. And in the ark was a little baby. She named him Moses. Moses basically means to draw out because she drew him out of water. She rescued him from the Nile, and she adopted Moses as her son. No doubt Moses knew of this temple. No, no doubt he walked in this temple, probably, you know, uh, did some things in that temple there. Um, so Moses, this prince uh, of, of Egypt, would have been very familiar with this, this temple here. But we still need to understand why Tud Moses III wanted the name of Hatshepsut to race from Egyptian history. We need to learn a little bit more about her, you know. So she was the daughter of Pharaoh Tud Moses I. She was raised in the royal courts of Egypt. Her sister and two brothers died early in their lives. After her father died, her half-brother Tud Moses II became Pharaoh. Since he was a lesser son of a lesser wife to Tud Moses I, he needed a royal bride of 100% royal blood to help legitimize his claim to the throne as Pharaoh. So at 15, Tud Moses II married Hatshepsut, who was at the time 12 years old. Together, they had only one child, a girl. Her husband, Tud Moses II, later took a lesser wife and had a son through her, and he named him Tud Moses III. Now, it's important to know that this was not Hatshepsut's son. 
And, and so she had reason to resent him. She was the son of another wife of her husband. Now, during all this time, she found an ark in the Nile with a Hebrew baby that she adopted and named Moses. When Hatshepsut's husband, Tud Moses II, died unexpectedly at the age of 31, she became the regent queen of Egypt, the first woman pharaoh. It's interesting, if you go look at some of her statues over there, she's, she's actually pre- presenting herself like a man and dressed like a man, but she was actually a woman. But um, she wanted to you know, present herself like a man. She was the first, again, woman pharaoh of, of Egypt. Now, during this time, Tud Moses III was only three years old and not her real son. Apparently, she wanted her adopted son, Moses, to be the next pharaoh. She didn't choose Tud Moses III because of obvious reasons. She resented him because he was not her son. Moses was her son, and the Bible tells us that Moses was trained in Pharaoh's court. Um, He had all the learning of Egypt, but we know that he did not become Pharaoh. Why? Well, the Bible tells us. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So Moses made a choice um, to follow the calling that God had in his life. And so he was being groomed to be the next Pharaoh. He could have had all the treasures of Egypt, but he chose rather to be numbered with the people of God. And after Tud Moses III went to the throne, he kind of was a little bit angry. And in a fit of revenge, he embarked on this campaign to wipe out Hatshepsut's memory. So he chiseled out all her inscriptions tore down her statutes. It all fits together with the biblical record. And again, if you go to that temple, you'll see that for yourself about these monuments and these inscriptions. By the way, her mummy is in the um, Museum of uh, Civilization there in Cairo, and that's her mummy right there. That's the woman who pulled Moses out of the Nile. So again, it's just incredible when you see some of these things. And um, I need to move on quickly here. We went to the Valley of the Kings. Again, this is a place where um, on the west bank of the Nile, uh, many, many pharaohs are buried here. In fact, this is a list here of where the KV is, um, is uh, it's actually Kings Valley 1, King Valley 2. These are where all the tombs are. And uh, they're not all open when you go there, but many of them are. They open up only the most impressive ones, you know, for you to look at. And so 49 pharaohs were buried in secret tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Actually, it's more than that. I think it's up to 60, but... Anyway, this is what you see when you go into those tombs there, and there is writings on the wall that all depict after-death rituals of crossing over into the next life, you know, appearing before gods and so on. Um, All these rituals are there painted on the walls inside of these tombs. This is the tomb of King Tut, and there he is laid out there. Um, And that's the one tomb that's, you know, everybody wants to go to that tomb and see it. Um, always people that want to want to go there, but it's just very interesting when you look at all of these tombs, um, all the rituals about crossing over into the next life. You know what the Bible tells us that innately all men know that there's an eternity, and 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 we see this in these tombs. They all have the sense of any of a life after this one. Of course, they don't got it right, and they, they have all these rituals, and you know they bury you know, with the pharaohs, all these things they think they're going to need for the next life. Um, so they know innately that there is an eternity, and that's what we see here in these, in these pictures and these places where the tombs were, were laid there. There's one tomb uh, painting called the uh, Weighing of the Heart. According to the Egyptians, this happened in order for a person to be able to go to the afterlife. Um, you know, basically, your heart was weighed. Um, you see that scale there? On one side is the feather of Ma'at, and on the, the other side is a container that has the person's heart in that container. Um, so if a person's heart was heavy, then they were not fit for eternal life. If your heart was heavier than the feather, that meant that you're not going to make it into Egyptian heaven because your heart was heavy. But if your heart was light because you did a lot of good things, if it was lighter than the feather, then that means you would go to the field of reeds, which was the Egyptian version of heaven. Um, so really, it, Egyptian religion was all works salvation, What right? You got to do good, 
You do bad, you get a heavy heart or a hardened heart. Does that sound familiar? A hardened heart? Because we read about Pharaoh in the, in the Bible where his heart was hardened. And so at death, the heart was weighed in a great big scale. Um, on, again, one side was the feather of Maat, the goddess of truth and justice. And um, waiting, if your heart was, uh, was heavy, uh, it would be eaten by the feared god goddess Amut, who had the head of a crocodile and was also part lion and part hippo. Uh, these were animals that were feared and respected by the Egyptians. But again, this is all man-made religion, right? And you, and you, you read about some of these rituals in the Book of the Dead. But we have a, a living book called the Bible, right? And the Bible tells us about what happens after death. It makes it crystal clear that it's not by works, but it's by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, uh, by, by the way, this is an image of uh, uh, Amenhotep II. Again, this is his mummy that's in the Cairo Museum in, uh, there in Egypt. This is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. You're looking at his mummy right here. Now, some people say, wait a minute. I thought that he was drowned in the Red Sea. No, the Bible didn't say he was drowned. It says his army was drowned in the Red Sea. He went on the reign 20 more years after that event. Um, but it, several times it says that he hardened his heart against God. Exodus 8.15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart, and he hearkened not unto them. And again, Exodus 8.32, Pharaoh hardened his heart. The word hardened, kabed, means to be heavy. Again, that's interesting. I believe this to be a reference to the Egyptian understanding of sinfulness, a heavy heart or a hardened heart which meant that his heart, Pharaoh's heart, was a heart of sin and, um, before God. And, and of course, in, in the Bible, it tells us that what happens when we get saved, by the way, the Bible uses that image to talk about a hardened heart as being sinful. But when we get saved, what does God do? He removes a heart of stone and he gives us what? A heart of flesh. You know, again, I believe this relates to that custom there in, in, uh, in Egypt. Um, so, again, I, we are really over time here, and I wanted to move forward and show you some other pictures of um, some things here. But let me just talk about Bible prophecy in, in um, Egypt. Um, there are several prophecies that were made about Egypt that we, I see have come to f be fulfilled. One of them is that there should be no longer be princes from the land of Egypt. Um, and in other words, God said, you know, even though e the Egyptian empire ruled the world really for many, many years, God said there's going to come a time where there'll be no more princes from the land of Egypt. Uh, and so since 350 B.C. until today, the land of the pharaohs has not had an Egyptian prince sit on the throne. Um, they've, they've had Persians, they've had Greeks, they've had Romans, Turks, French, British overlords, but no Egyptian pharaoh. And that's exactly what the Bible says. Another prediction is, you know, this is papyrus paper. I actually had some, uh, we're out of time here, but David has up here, I brought some papyrus paper. Um, this is paper that's made from the reeds that grow along the Nile. You can, after church, if you want to look at some of that, you can. But basically what they do is they cut it in strips um, and they um, make paper out of it. They, they lay these strips between layers of cloth and then they, they basically pound it with a, a wooden mallet before placing a, a, a big stone over it to flatten it out. They leave it there for about a week, and basically what you get is you get this paper. And this was something that made uh, Egypt rich. Um, they would export this paper. In fact, paper comes from the word papyrus. Um, our Bible was written on papyrus manuscripts. And it's such sturdy paper that some of those manuscripts, thousands of years old, they're still around today. That's how sturdy this paper was. And so this brought great wealth to the land of Egypt. But did you know that the Bible says that there's going to come, there was going to, be, going to come a time when the, pap, the, the papyrus reeds will be gone? And it's amazing when you go to Egypt now, you don't really see the, the sides of the Nile River with these papyrus reeds anymore. Now, they've learned how to grow it, but it doesn't grow along the Nile. It's gone there, and it disappeared. In the old days, it was everywhere. And why is it gone now? Well, the Bible says in Isaiah 19.7, the papyrus reeds by the river will wither, 
and be driven away and be no more. I asked our guide, our guide Fayed, about this, and he said, you know, we do have some papyrus along the now. He said, but it's not the same as what used to grow there. What used to grow there, we don't see it anymore. And again, this is the fulfillment of what Scripture says. Another prophecy was about the city of Memphis. Memphis was the religious and political capital of Egypt for many years. It would have looked something like this. However, today, if you go there, what you see are a bunch of broken statutes and monuments. They're all gone. I mean, we looked around there, and we saw nothing but broken statues and monuments all over. And why is that? Well, another prophecy. This is what the sovereign Lord says, I will destroy the idols and put an end to the images of Memphis. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. You look around, they're all destroyed there. You go to other temples, you'll see, um, you'll see images that are, st- that are in good condition, but you go to Memphis, and what you see basically are these broken statues there. And again, that's what Scripture said. Um, so those are just some prophecies there. And uh, I want to um, move on here and kind of end it with um, showing you some of the t- temples that we visited one of them was Abu Simbel. This is one of the great temples of Egypt, located 700 miles south of Cairo. This is a temple of Ramses the Great. Our team um, went there. Actually, not everybody went because you had to drive three and a half hours through the desert to get here. And so not everybody wanted to make that drive. And, um, but here are the brave few that made the trip here. We're standing in front of one of two temples there. It's a temple. One is dedicated to Ramses the Great. This is to his queen, Nefertiri, um, this temple that's behind us there. But this is just an incredible temple. And most of the inscriptions in the temple are dedicated to Ramses and his battle against the Hittites that I already talked about. Uh, He was very proud of that victory because basically he defeated an army that was twice the size of his. So you go around, all these inscriptions on the wall boast about his victory over the Hittites. And these are images of, of Ramses there in the temple. But one thing that we saw here um, that our guide told us to look for and we were able to find is um, this, this, basically what you see here is a, uh, this is a scene that's in the middle of Ramses' war camp. And what you see in the middle of his camp is a tent that looks like a tabernacle. And, you, and what you also see is that here are some people worshiping at this tabernacle, and also you see the red arrow there pointing to two cherubim with their wings outstretched, and in between the cherubim is a cartouche of the God that they're worshiping. Now, um, now this is not the, the temple, or excuse me, the tabernacle in Exodus. We know that that's different, completely different than this here. Um, but what this does demonstrate is that scholars who criticized the Exodus account of the tabernacle, um, they were wrong because they asserted that the tabernacle was really biblical writers, later biblical writers, were actually, what they were doing is they were projecting back into time the temple in tent form. They said there was no such thing as a tabernacle that was ascribed in the book of Exodus. But, um, but this inscription demonstrates that this type of portable shrine, such as a tabernacle in the wilderness, uh, was known in ancient Egypt, at least up until the time of Ramses. So once again, inscriptions on temples show the historicity of the Bible. There was a tabernacle. Egyptians used to do this. God had his own tabernacle for the Israelites, where they worshipped the true and the living God. These were false gods that they worshipped, but God was the true and the living God. So we found that that was very interesting there in that, in that temple there um, of, of um, an Abu symbol. And this is the water that uh, you see as you're looking out from the temple. We also went to the temple of Horus. We took carriage rides to get there. Um, this is a temple dedicated to the, the god who was, uh, had the head of a falcon, a false god, obviously. And then also the temple of Kam Ambo, which was the god of the, of the crocodiles, um, you know, another beautiful temple. And when I visit these temples, you know what it reminds me of? Romans chapter 1, they, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, became vain in their imagination, their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools 
and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man or to birds and creeping things. That's what you see here in these temples dedicated to these gods that they made up in their own mind. These temples to me are nothing but statutes to the depravity of man because they're not worshiping the true and the living God. They make up their own God. Temple of Philae here um, was the last temple that we visited. And what we saw there were inscriptions basically in 550 A.D. where Christians began to worship there. Christianity began to grow in Egypt. And, 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 and basically the worship of these gods began to fade away. And Christianity for a time there flourished in Egypt. And we found here even in this temple inscriptions that basically show that Christians met at this place to worship the one true God, Jesus Christ, uh, the, the, the Son of God. So this, this temple reminds me of what the Bible says in Matthew 16, 13. Um, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. All right. That's as much as I could squeeze in of this trip here. So that's all I have to say. All right. Let's all stand together. And... Uh, we're going to close in a song. Again, uh, David's got some of this papyrus down here if you want to uh, look at some of that. Kind of a show-and-tell thing I brought here for you if you're interested in that afterwards. All right, John, come and lead us. <laughs>